<clears throat> okay, we'll talk a little bit about lower respiratory tract infections. <clears throat> The typical morbidity mortality curves tends to have this wavy line with uh, more deaths occurring in the winter. The obituary columns tend to be longer in the winter, and it's felt that a lot of this is due to respiratory infections, with uh, spikes being caused by influenza epidemics. Now, there are a lot of different ways to look at lower respiratory tract infections. Uh, Bronchitis, tracheitis is not too commonly seen as a clinical entity. Bronchiolitis tends to be a disease of what population group? Little children. And then pneumonia, <laughs> based on the radiographic pattern, can be classified in a number of different ways. Bronchial pneumonia, segmental, lobar, interstitial pneumonia. Acute bronchitis or chest cold, usually virus. Tremendous cause of overuse of antibiotics. We're currently concerned about pertussis being a cause of chronic bronchitis in adults. And is interested now in uh, using a pertussis vaccine in adults. And sometimes mycoplasma pneumonia and chlamydia pneumonia, are two causes of what we're going to look at is atypical pneumonia may have a, a role. Chronic bronchitis in people who smoke. How many of you smoke? None of you smoke? <laughs> what? Is there one smoker in the class? Four. <laughs> How many did you say? Approximately four. Five. Five. There, there are four smokers in the class. <laughs> Exacerbations of chronic obstructive lung disease may be caused by infectious agents. That's a little bit controversial. <clears throat> bronchiectasis, this talk is lectures mainly about pneumonia, but bronchiectasis is something bad that can happen with, what, is, what does it literally mean, the term bronchiectasis? Right, dilatation or ectasia of the bronchi. Cystic fibrosis, of course, would be a classic cause, but repeated infections can cause bronchiectasis, and it's a miserable thing to have because you tend to cough up sputum every day and you never quite get well. And this is a lady with bronchiectasis involving this area of the lung is shown here. We're seeing this more and more with bronchiectasis in adults, particularly women, caused by one of the mycobacteria, Mycobacterium avium intracellulari, or MAC. And it's thought that the reason this may be happening is that nowadays, Everybody uses showers, right, instead of bathing in a bathtub. And that you, by law, you can't get the temperature of the water above 120 degrees. And this may allow mycobacteria to grow so that you may be actually, when you take a shower, aerosolizing bugs. It's frightening, isn't it? Pneumonia is... Uh, big problem. 
It's the only infectious disease which is in the top ten causes of death. In the United States, about three million cases a year, half a million hospitalizations, especially in the winter. About half the cases and most of the deaths are from bacteria. When we talk about pneumonia, there are lots of things that can cause pneumonia, and frequently we don't know the etiology of pneumonia. But serious pneumonia that leads to death is usually a bacterial disease. And one thing about pneumonia is that ideally you'd like to make a precise diagnosis, but it's hard to get good bacteriology. So that more and more people are, unfortunately, I'm with the old school that likes to look at gram stains of expectorated sputum and try to divine the cause of pneumonia, more and more that's being looked at as a lost art and their algorithms about bombing patients with antibiotics. And this slide by is Dr. Olson still teaching the medical school at all? Dr. Gerald Olson. He was a fixture here in the medical school for many years and was a master teacher and loved to make slides and uh, this is one of the slides that he made of pneumonia as a board game. And uh, you start here, fever, chills, cough, pulmonary infiltrates. You look at the sputum, blood cultures and pleural fluids help you make a, a precise diagnosis that are rarely positive. Serology, too late, the patient died where you can, you can uh, uh, put a needle in the lung, uh-oh, pneumothorax, go back three spaces. It gets worse, you get an open lung biopsy, surgeon out of town, go back one space, autopsy, you lose, specific therapy, you win. So it's a wonderful slide. But it makes a point that we can sort of certify the diagnosis of pneumonia if you have a positive blood culture Otherwise, it, we're frequently in the dark as to what is the cause of pneumonia. And so there are emerging technologies. And for you, I hope that you're able to come up with something. Looking at urinary antigens for pneumococci is, has been helpful. <clears throat> Nearly all studies indicate that streptococcus pneumonia remains the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia of sufficient severity, at least, to get you in the hospital. H. flu, more axilla cateralis, increasing in frequency. Legionnaire's disease in some geographic areas, apparently not in ours. Chlamydia pneumonia may cause some cases. In HIV, uh, it's maybe one of the more common pneumonias that we see now, pneumocystis carinii. Several ways to look at pneumonia. Most cases of pneumonia are due to previously colonizing flora, going back to that little diagram that we had of the respiratory tract. And the organisms reach your lungs by spread through the bronchi. In the top line here, rarely you can get pneumonia by inhaling the organisms. Legionnaire's disease would be a, a good example in which people just walking by the Bellevue Stratford back in the heyday of the outbreak of 1976 would sometimes get pneumonia. And really virulent pathogens. Give me an example of a highly virulent pathogen that you might inhale and get pneumonia from. Excuse me? What? Tularemia. Tularemia. Great. You got it. And uh, how did you get it? From my earlier lecture or another earlier? What's that? So as, as you drive down the interstate, who might get tularemia? 
What? Yeah, one, one pearl in recent years is people have gotten it, the people who mow the grass along interstate highways. There have been occasional cases run over a sick, dead rabbit, and you might get, uh, you might get tularemia. Uh, plague might do it as well, but tularemia, that's one reason it's dangerous to try to isolate that organism. And on the second line, lymphohematogenous. Sometimes organisms can get to the lungs by way of the bloodstream. And that would tend to cause a patchy bilateral pneumonia. Pulmonary clearance, uh, the concept is looking, going back to that figure with which we began the first lecture. Uh, the idea that you're, most of us get bacteria in our lungs nearly every day but the mucociliary blanket propels them upwards and then we swallow them. If that's impaired, uh, then we can get uh, pneumonia. The final line of defense is obviously the alveolar macrophage, but you can show experimentally that you can impair pulmonary clearance by a virus, by exposing rabbits or whatever to cigarette smoke, you can actually see the cilia wither up by drinking, uremia, bronchial obstruction, 100% oxygen, etc. Physiology of pneumonia, ventilation per perfusion mismatching leads to hypoxemia. You know about that? Hyperdynamic circulation, toxic cardiomyopathy, uh, perhaps, increased oxygen demand, stiff lungs, increasing the work of breathing, bad things happen. Now, the classic way to look at pneumonia, which is being blurred now, because in practice it's often difficult to make this distinction, but I, I think conceptually it's an important distinction to make, and I think clinically I believe it's maybe important as well to look at typical versus atypical pneumonia. The idea being that typical pneumonia is caused by certain organisms like the pneumococcus, whereas atypical pneumonia tends to be caused by viruses and mycoplasma pneumoniae, which is the prototypical organism of atypical pneumonia. Typical pneumonia, an abrupt onset, you can remember when it came on. And I like to ask patients, when was the last time you were in your usual state of good health? Well, at 3 o'clock yesterday, all of a sudden, I, I started coughing and I had pain in the right side of my chest when I, when I took a deep breath or I coughed. Atypical pneumonia, well, gosh, started feeling a little bit draggy and then... So typical pneumonia, an abrupt onset, reductive cough with a lot of sputum coming up, Pleuritic chest pain, which means pain is from the pleura. It hurts when you cough or take a deep breath. Physical examination is impressive, and the white blood cells have a lot to say to you. There's a high white count, or there may be a low white count with a dramatic shift to the left, a lot of bands, band forms. Atypical pneumonia, by contrast, mycoplasma and others, gradual onset, Non-productive cough, you're coughing, but doctor asks for a specimen and you're embarrassed, you can't really bring much, much of one up. Pain is beneath the chest, examination is unimpressive, white blood count uh, tends to be normal. And this is a scheme of typical versus atypical pneumonia. This little diagram of the lung, representing the lung, is a trachea, two main bronchi, and one alveolus, is sometimes called the Comro lung after the guy who uh, taught pulmonary physiology in a simplified way. But think of typical pneumonia as being an alveolar disease in which there's a lot of exudate in the alveolus. In fact, that's what happens in pneumococcal pneumonia. The organism streams through little holes called the pores of cone, it spreads from one alveolus to another until it's 
stopped by one of the major fissures in the lung. So it's an alveolar disease. The lung is socked in. Because it tends to go out to the periphery of the lung, you get pain, which is pleuritic. It hurts when you take a deep breath. You're bringing up a lot of sputum, and there's a, a marked systemic response to this, inflammatory response, with a high white count and a shift to the left. Atypical pneumonia, on the other hand, the problem is not in the alveoli, but the problem is in the tracheobronchial mucosa and the interstitium of the lung. Your chest hurts, but your chest hurts here. That's where your sternum and your major bronchi are. Now, how many of you have had a chest cold and it hurt here? None of you? You have, but not the rest of you. My, you all been spared. Scanning non purulent sputum and a normal white count, You're not very sick. So that would be an atypical pneumonia. Now, which of these two people has a typical pneumonia and which has an atypical pneumonia? <clears throat> Hard to say, isn't it, on this? examination findings. Uh, this person uh, was an alcoholic with some chronic lung disease who comes in and he's sick and had streptococcus pneumonia in his blood. This is a, a healthy young mother in whom uh, was sent to me as a classic pneumococcal pneumonia. But I listened to the lung, I didn't hear very much. And it was a gradual onset and she had young children at home. So this was a typical story of Mycoplasma pneumonia uh, really running around the family with the children getting it and then bringing it home to mom. So they looked similar on the x ray. Some clues in pneumonia a single hard shaking chill in the onset suggests the pneumococcus. Multiple chills suggest the staph RS or Klebsiella. Relative bradycardia, that can be an important clue. That, what that means uh, is that normally, and it's a little bit arguable, what I'm telling you is that the, uh, the pulse rate should go up, if you're sick, about 10 beats per minute for each degree elevation in Fahrenheit. And uh, viruses, mycoplasma, psittacosis, tularemia seem to regularly cause a relative bradycardia. You know, I once just walked into a patient's room, looked at the chart, and diagnosed tularemia on that basis. Tularemia, rabbits, ticks and fleas, inhalation, as we mentioned. After you ask somebody the hundredth time if they've been skinning rabbits, you get over your inhibitions about asking that. Or do you have a sick parakeet at home? Have you been uh, spelunking out in the Four Corners area? And then Legionnaire's disease, contaminated aerosols, air coolers, hospital water supplies. So the history can help. Uh, the fungal diseases that Dr. DeSalvo talked about, the regional mycoses particularly, can uh, cause pneumonia because these are inhalation diseases. And not uncommonly, people will have, well, I, I should say uncommonly, but it, it, it happens. You can get a chest X-ray and you happen to have cryptococcosis or histo or coxy. It was asymptomatic and it would be resolved normally. But the regional mycoses, and you remember histo in the great Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys, coxy in the southwest, Pneumocystis carinii with HIV risk factors. Q fever, goats, sheep, cattle, melioidosis. Uncommon now, brucellosis. Saw uh, two cases recently in people who were lived in Richland County and were uh, were uh, had had uh, killed wild pigs. And anthrax has been in the news, right? It used to be called wool sorters disease. 
classically somebody who unloaded, say, wool from Afghanistan on a dock. We talk about pneumococcal pneumonia. We talk about the major causes of pneumonia. Simply being older tends to be the main predisposing cause, but there are some famous associations. Younger people with sickle cell disease have a lot of pneumococcal disease. Asplenia, you had that yet? This is big. If you have no spleen, pneumococcal disease is no more frequent, but tends to be very overwhelming. In the absence of a spleen, you can die rapidly from overwhelming pneumococcal disease. We'll have another slide about that. If you have a problem with making IgG antibody, particularly agammaglobinemia, also multiple myeloma, and to a lesser extent, CLL, problem making type specific antibody. So, hum problem with humoral immunity, pneumococcal disease. Then it cut several others, nephrotic syndrome, for some reason, cirrhosis of the liver, and alcoholism. So these are some of the major predisposing causes to pneumococcal disease. Here we have a gram stain of pneumococcal disease. I, I can't touch this screen, can I? It'll, it'll go off, right? No, that's okay. I think they can see it all right. Are these gram positive or gram negative? What? Let's, let's go with purple. Okay. And it, uh, the diplococci here, right, tend to be in, in pairs. It was renamed, it used to be called Streptococcus, I mean, Diplococcus pneumoniae. It was renamed Streptococcus pneumoniae to emphasize its kinship with the other Streptococci. And sometimes it can chain up. The rule of thumb is that no more than six organisms in a chain. And by lancet shape, it means that it's shaped sort of like this. So this is Diplococcus, Diplococcus in which, and I'll show you a slide of this later on, the long axis of the pair parallels the long axis of the individual cells. In contrast to a biscuit-shaped diplococcus, and I drew that in red because this would be the gram-negative meningococcus or the gonococcus, which look like stacked donuts, in which the long axis of the pair is perpendicular to the long axis of the individual cells. So I think I can sell you on that here on the gram stain, how they're sort of elongated. So that's pneumococcus. And classically, we don't see the classic form anymore. It's described by William Osler and others. Upper respiratory tract infection, it begins suddenly with a violent chill and fever, fluidic chest pain, lobar consolidation. And by lobar consolidation, we mean the idea that the whole lobe of the lung is opacified, and there will be physical findings that go along with that. And untreated in the old days, it could either end suddenly with a crisis and a drenching uh, sweat or gradually by lysis. Pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia nowadays is more atypical, which is why it may be hard to distinguish from atypical pneumonia. Early on, signs of consolidation are absent. Older people may lack fever in the classic history. Chronic lung disease distorts the architecture. People have been drinking a lot, won't be able to give you this dramatic history. Epilepsy, they may have anaerobes. Fever, tachycardia may be attributed to seizures. Some people get pneumonia over and over again. It's in the same area. I mean, obviously, you could have a, a tumor obstructing a bronchus, or you could have bronchiectasis. And some current problems with pneumococcal disease 
uh, are shown here. One is that despite our uh, tremendous array of antibiotics, some people still die of pneumococcal pneumonia early on in the first several days. And a classic uh, study by Dr. Robert Austrian, published in 1964, showed that if you look at survival rate plotted against days for pneumococcal pneumonia, let's make this out to about 21 or so, that without any antibiotics, the uh, mortality rate for pneumococcal pneumonia with positive blood cultures, that was clear-cut bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia, was about 70 to 80 percent. With antibiotics, it lowered it to about 20 percent, but the mortality in the first several days was the same. That uh, antibiotics did not lower the mortality early on, suggesting we may need some other things. We're going to look uh, fairly rapidly at some of the other causes of pneumonia. Group A streptococcal pneumonia, Streptococcus pyogenes, is a rare cause of pneumonia, but except during flu epidemics, but is distinctive in that you tend to get a very large empyema. In this case, the entire right lung is white, right? Like, where did it go? Now, someone describe this gram stain for me. What do you see? Excuse me? Are you looking at that on your computer? Oh, you all have it so much better than we did. We <laughs> used to have to actually take notes, and there were no handouts. Excuse me? It looks like a diplococcus, doesn't it, sometimes? Well, what about that one? Doesn't that look like kind of like a rod or something? Are they small or large? Small. Are they red or blue? <laughs> They're red. So they're gram positive or negative? Right. So they, some of them look like little dots, don't they? Some look like little dots, and yet some of them look like bacilli, right? So they're small, they're gram negative. Were the shapes the same, or they have different shapes? Pleomorphic, small, gram-negative, pleomorphic, and we can't decide whether it's a coccus or rod, so we can say coccobacilli. Small, pleomorphic, gram-negative, coccobacilli. So let's say, excuse me? How did you do that? Uh, good memory. Very good memory. You have photographic memory? Does anybody here have a photographic memory? Have you known anybody who had one? You have? Who? Yeah. He has a photographic memory? Really? He can't remember anything. I've known, I've known two people who have photographic memories. Small, pleomorphic, gram-negative coccobacilli. And that is, as my friend says here, species for Haemophilus influenzae. So we're going to say that in uniform. I, I, I'm going to put this on my exam. Small, gram-negative, pleomorphic coccobacilli. Say it. Small, gram-negative, pleomorphic coccobacilli. 
And this is a, 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 a very, I think, almost a diagnostic gram stain. A couple of other things uh, might look like this, but by and large, it's, it's hemophilus influenza, small gram-negative pleomorphic cockabacilla, H. flu. Can cause community-acquired pneumonia, may be increasing in adults, underlying lung disease, alcoholism, advanced age, often Apache pneumonia, virtually diagnostic, small, pleomorphic, gram-negative, cacobacilli, H. flu. Moraxella cateralis is a larger gram-negative diplococcus uh, and is uh, Apache pneumonia, and I'll just mention it, particularly in chronic lung disease, Moraxella cateralis. Mycoplasma pneumonia is a classic cause of atypical pneumonia, typically younger adults, often parents of younger children. Subtle presentation favors the lower lobes. Plural effusion can occur. Mycoplasma pneumonia. And uh, one thing about the atypical pneumonias in general, you can draw a, a table or column with usual typical pneumonia, pneumococcus, H. flu, and then group A strep, maybe staph. And atypical pneumonias, mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, uh, fungi, uh, HIV, tularemia, psittacosis. They tend to be things with the atypical pneumonias that draw your attention outside of the chest, extrapulmonary manifestations. And mycoplasma pneumonia, the red ear, sometimes bullous, a bleb on the tympanic membrane, hemolytic anemia, rare, but it does happen, arthritis, arthralgias, pericarditis. And the atypical pneumonias, for some reason, nearly all of them tend to have mild abnormalities of the liver function tests. Rashes with the atypical pneumonias, and sometimes neurologic manifestations, so things that draw your attention outside of the chest. Chlamydia pneumonia, we have not diagnosed here very often. It's a tough diagnosis to make, and we don't have good ways to diagnose it yet, although there is a serology available. Most commonly, it tends to cause an upper respiratory infection, but can cause a pneumonia. And this is another cause of atypical pneumonia, but it tends to affect an older crowd than mycoplasma pneumonia, making the point here that this is mycoplasma pneumonia by age group, and this is chlamydia pneumonia shown here, tending to affect older folks. Chlamydia pneumonia. Legionella. In some places like Pittsburgh, it's been very common as a cause of community-acquired pneumonia. It's an inhalation disease, not part of the normal flora, the pros in Legionella tell me that it's, it's tough to distinguish Legionella from other pneumonias. There do tend to be some clues, like the other atypical pneumonias, that tend to be patchy infiltrates rather than lobar consolidation. It may progress rapidly, and there tend to be things that direct your attention outside the chest. Headache, renal failure, abnormal liver function tests, there also may be relative uh, bradycardia. The gram stain may show purulence without predominant organism. You, you diagnose the organism by finding it on a fluorescent antibody test. There's also a urinary antigen test that will be positive in about in Legionella pneumonia. Uh, 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 or Legionella pneumophila, type 1, but unfortunately that causes only about 70% of cases. A lot of pneumonias that we see are, uh, particularly in, in alcoholics and in people with very poor oral hygiene, are due to mouth flora, subacute illness with some combination of alcoholism, malnutrition, homelessness, and poor dentition. Sputum has a very bad odor, tends to be a necrotizing pneumonia with lung abscess, air fluid levels, and empyema. Now, what is in this Gram stain? What do you see? 
see a neutrophil, and what's in the cytoplasm? Sure, gram, positive or negative? Excuse me? Yeah, that's a gram-negative rod. The idea of looking at the gram strain, which uh, is seeming to become a lost art for clinicians, now that yet medical students are no longer required to buy microscopes, and our residents don't do the gram stains like we used to do, is to try to find a thin area of the sputum and look at it carefully, and that's the gram-negative rod. Uh, Gram-negative rods are a very important cause of pneumonia in the hospital, in hospitalized patients. And it, as it turns out, if you're bad sick in the hospital, gram-negative rods will colonize your throat. And so particularly in the intensive care unit and ventilator-associated pneumonias, we see a lot of gram-negative rods. Mark this well, uh, write this down, reward those of you in class. Pseudomonas tends to cause hospital-acquired pneumonia in people on ventilators. Pseudomonas in Columbia, I found that that is the leading cause. So in summary, pneumonia is the sixth leading cause of death most common hospital-acquired infection causing death. And again, in hospitalized patients, we look at pseudomonas. We also look at staph. Precise diagnosis, desirable, but all too often not obtained. We need better diagnostic tests, and I like to use the gram stain. Any questions? Read those two lectures. Okay. No exams this week. Lots of lectures.